All right, everyone, welcome back to the Red Beard Outdoors podcast. I've got an amazing guest today. His name is Joel Turner. If you haven't heard of him by now, I don't know where you've been, uh, but Joel is really, honestly, the main reason I wanted to have you on today was because of the difference you've made in my archery technique, in my shooting habits. Um, I didn't have bad habits before I found your information, which you put so much information out there. Uh, you've got an amazing course as well, but finding your information, your, your, uh, the skills that you teach has helped me tons and it has helped many, many people out there, whether it be from rifle shooting, pistol shooting to archery. Uh, but Joel has a course called shot IQ. He's retired from uh, SWAT and many other service, uh, avenues that he's been in. And he loves teaching people how to just be able to control your mind and be able to calm down and focus and and just execute a good shot. So, uh, Joel, tell us a little bit about, I guess, your course and, uh, you know, what people want to know. Why would they want to join up? So this, uh, you know, I, I went through a lifetime of not shooting well. And it was, but I loved shooting. And I started shooting a center power rifle when I was five years old. Started shooting a bow when I was seven. And... Uh, I just wasn't, I wasn't that good at it. I just loved shooting. And, but when it came to light recoil weapon systems, like air rifles, BB guns, you know, 22s, I was really good shotguns. I was good to go, but you put me on a centerfire rifle and I was a nightmare. And then you put me on an, on a bow and it was even worse. But what did I know back there? Seven, eight years old, uh, just slinging arrows through the air was, was the best. Right. So <laughs> Uh, fast forward to teenage years. I started bow hunting when I was 14. Uh, extremely unsuccessful in that. Uh, just I started working in a bow shop when I was 16. Watching these people shoot, but not knowing why they were good or why they weren't good. And they couldn't explain it to me. And, you know, a lot of times back then, like this is early 90s, they were fixing mental problems with mechanical means, similar to what we do these days. And, uh, so fast forward past that college, then I worked for USDA wildlife services. I did a lot of shooting in that job, but it was all air rifles, uh, 22s, 17s, all that stuff. So it was all good to go. Lots of shotgunning, but there would be coyote contracts that would come up where I'm supposed to shoot this coyote in the middle of a city you know, you call it in, you get one chance at it. I'm shooting at it with a center fire rifle. You can't shoot twice, right? You have to shoot one time and I would screw it up. Like literally every time, as soon as the crossers would get on hair, I'd yank the trigger and I would miss. And then I'd have to go away and I have to tell my boss that I didn't, I wasn't successful in that particular mission or whatever. And that was directly related to what I was doing in bow hunting. I, I'm a two-time world elk calling champion. I can call elk in like a chicken on a string. But it took me 13 years to kill one with my bow because I couldn't hold myself together. It was ridiculous, the shots that I took. I mean, absolute blackout, uh, holding high, holding low, could never put my pin where I wanted it. So I started shooting bare bow, and that made things even worse. <laughs> I was trying to find the solution to it. And then... When I became a cop, then I had to find the solution. And it scares the heck out of me today to know that most cops don't know how they're going to do what they're going to do, especially when it comes to a high stress precision event. Those are usually end up being 40 round gunfights where nobody hits anybody. And that's just the reality of it because there's science that's working against us. But that's what I had to figure out. What is the science of the mind and how is how does it work? And how do we put this package together? Because there's several different sciences at work that uh, had never been put in a package before. And so that's what I did is I, I packaged these sciences up and came out with control process shooting. And um, it is life changing stuff now. And after, you know, recently I was on the Rogan podcast and, and Joe Rogan had bought my course like four years ago my online course. He was one of the first ones to buy it actually. And since that time, he's spoken about me on, on numerous different podcasts, mm -hmm. but I'd never got to meet him in person. And then through, through connections with other people, 
I ended up shooting in a backyard with Joe Rogan last December, which was really cool. And then after that, I got the invite to be on the podcast. But since that podcast, I have really had to broaden my horizons because now I have tons of people contacting me from all different walks of life, uh, golfers, like PGA golfers, NFL kickers, um, lots of baseball players, basketball players, lots of golfers, uh, polo cross, which I don't even really know what that is. I think it's lacrosse <laughs> on horseback, uh, drag racers, people with anxiety issues, psychiatrists, psychologists, all of these people are now contacting me to figure out how to put open and closed loop control systems mm. into their movements, their life, whatever it is. So shot IQ is for shooting, but it's also like we say shot control equals life control. And now we've started to define that. Like, what does that really mean? Because you as an archer, you love archery and it, somewhat defines you right bow hunting and and archery and it somewhat defines you it defines me i mean it is my life 100 percent archery and bow hunting and all those things shooting in general is that's just how i run my life and if you love something but it makes you so frustrated and the more you do it the worse you get it's very frustrating on a life level. So once you gain control of your shot, you start to gain control of other aspects of your life as well, as long as you understand how you did it. And that's where Shot IQ comes in with blueprinting. And how do you actually understand what you just did in this controlled shot? And how do you take that to other aspects of your life? Yep, exactly. It's uh, It really is life-changing. Um, you know, and I, I mentioned that, so I found you through elk shape through Dan, um, as I was getting into archery, uh, it was close to four years ago. And I just realized that you guys were real people that were passionate about archery and you want people, you weren't trying to necessarily sell something. Yes. You've got a course, but you weren't trying to just sell the course. You wanted people to actually get better. And I, I gravitate towards those kind of people. And so you know, learning the idea of pulling through the shot at the time I was on a, an index release. Now I've moved to a thumb release for reasons not related to uh, trigger control, um, but the anchoring that I prefer with the thumb release. And so, you know, going through that and then finally, so the first time I went to elk shape camp, I didn't get to meet you. You, d you weren't able to make it out to the Utah one that year. And then last year I loved how, man, everyone, I got so much feedback. My archery shop was like, man, some of the people were like, weren't you pissed that he was hitting your hat? Cause I walk <laughs> up to the line and he, and for those of you guys that haven't seen the video, um, you know, Joel goes up to me and takes one of my arrows and starts whacking the brim of my hat and puts the fletchings between my eye and the peep sight. And he's <laughs> like, Oh, red beard. Yeah. I've seen you shoot on Instagram. Let's see if you're really good at what you do. And, uh, you know, just talking all sorts of smack. Right. And the fact like it, it was awesome that I executed the shot and I, it's weird because I feel like I almost do better when I have that kind of pressure mm -hmm. because I, I don't know why, but like when I'm out shooting with my buddies and we're just BSing and talking, whatever, you know, I do okay. But then when my buddy's like in my ear or hitting me on the back with an arrow, just goofing around to Clint uh, McKinnis, right. you know, he'll do that stuff all the time. And I always like, pinwheel it whenever he's doing that so i don't know anyway long so, story short oh here's, go ahead here's why though because and the reason that i do that i'm not doing that to be an a-hole the reason that i do that at the beginning of the clinic is because people are nervous to shoot in front of others right and if they come in with a weak system it will break and I usually need it to break i i need you to fail to start with if you come in with a weak system I'm going to bring out those weaknesses by talking smack to you, whatever, by tapping the brim of your hat, sticking your fletch in there. What it does is it just changes your thought process and it pulls your mind out of the shot process and into what's this guy doing? I just want to not miss the target. And then when you do that, when you think about those things, 
you are going to punch the trigger. There's no question about it. But what you did is what some people do, and, and you're able to find determination through stress. So when somebody's in your ear, whatever, you're like, oh, yeah, watch this. <laughs> so that's the only difference is the determination. The task is no different, but you use stress to make you stronger. Now, that's you did it from the get go. So when I have somebody like you that comes to my clinic, I'll mess with you, but I'm I'm looking at what you do. And if you succeed in that, then I have to make sure that you've blueprinted it. So you know exactly how you did it so that you can repeat it over and over and over, no matter what the stress level is. So most people fail to start with. Then we go through the course. And then by the end, they now know how to use stress to make them stronger. And I always say, either you use the shot to make you stronger or you allow the shot to make you weaker. You choose, right? So that was the that was the difference in you is just your determination level. Your FU Turner factor was high enough that you got <laughs> through it to start with, right? So yeah. that's that's the two dynamics of people that I get with people like you, fairly rare. I'll get maybe two maybe two in a clinic and the rest of them are, you know, they shake like crazy when they shoot in front of me or in front of people or whatever. And it has purpose. So if I'm talking smack to somebody, it has specific purpose. So I always have to preface it with that. Like, don't worry about what I'm doing. Just it has purpose. So yeah. uh, it works out pretty good though. Yeah. I, I, I had to clarify to a couple of people. I'm like, he's not like that all the time. He's doing that for a reason. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's not, <laughs> that's not how he just walks around, you know, talking smack to people. That's not, right. that's not who Joel is. Right, right. Uh, but no, it, it's funny though, because just kind of segueing into being a dad mm -hmm. and, and there's certain situations where, you know, I have to not allow my son who is me and him, butt heads, he's our eight year old. And, you know, it frustrates me because they tried to, uh, what is it, the diagnosis, oppositional defiance disorder. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you oh, mean yeah. he was a young boy like <laughs> that yeah. wants to go and do things and argue? I'm right. like, I don't want to I don't want to get that out of him because one day, like, it's good to question things. It'll it'll come out. It'll turn around and, and be a good thing. Right now, it's frustrating because I'm dad and I want you yeah. to listen. Okay. But, uh, you know, when I get in those higher stress situations, it is nice to be able to you know, take that step back, kind of detach a little bit and have that almost a, make a blueprint for those situations. It's not the exact same as shooting, but it's very similar. Not so, letting those emotions run high. Exactly. So let me ask you a very specific question. Now, since the Rogan podcast with all these people that are coming to me for advice now, again, I've had to broaden my horizons and thinking a bit. So let me ask you this. Would you then, with the situation that you just described of being a dad, you know, you've got an eight-year-old boy that's questioning what you're, the advice that you're giving him. Would you agree that there is a mental game to fatherhood? Yep. Would you agree there's a mental game to shooting? 100%. 100%, right? And people say all the time, well, I'm working on my mental game. And this was the question that I was asked the other day, and I'm going to ask it of you. And I don't necessarily need an answer, but I want you to think about this. I was asked the other day to define the mental game. Right? So when you think about that, and this could be this is the mental game of life. This is a very ubiquitous definition. So I'll give you just a second. Define the mental game. And, and take a situation, like take the situation yeah. that you were in with your son the other day. How do you well, define how you did what you did? The first thing that comes to mind is what's my focus? Mm -hmm. Like, what do I want him to do? Mm -hmm. And just like if you're with the shooting scenario, if you're focused on what you're saying, your trash talk, you're smacking my brim, mm -hmm. focusing on not missing, that's mm -hmm. all you think about. It's just like when, and I, I'm not perfect, obviously. So there are times where I let my emotions win, but the times that work out the best is when I'm, I take that step back, kind of detach mm -hmm. and I say emotionally detach and just say, what is it that I want him to do? Is this battle even worth it right now? And so what's my focus? So then I have him focus uh, instead of saying, no, don't do that or don't do that or don't do that. 
I start to change his focus of this is what I want you to do and why. And once he's focused on that, it, it goes great because he just wants an explanation why. But anyway, that that's what first comes to my mind is what finding your focus is the game. So every different scenario is going to be your focus. Right. So let me let me define that because that that's a great answer. Let me define it because a lot of people will will talk about focus and this and that. But here's a definition of the mental game. The mental game is defined as knowing when, where, and how to direct your conscious mind into a specific task at a specific moment. There is a moment of truth in almost every task that we do, right? When you're dealing with your son, there's a moment of truth at where you can either go to emotional spin out or you can come back, right? And you can think, okay, I want him to do this. How am I going to get him to do this? I need to put his conscious mind into this particular thing. How am I going to do it? Right. And the how is through speech, right? What you say is what you think. What you say is what your young man thinks as well. So every one of these moments or every task that we do in life has a moment of truth, especially true in shooting. Same is true in basketball, in golf in baseball, in fatherhood, in anxiety attacks, in anger management, in just about everything we do. Think about even getting out of bed. There's a mental game in getting out of bed. And this mental game has to do with overrides. Like, are you overriding your emotion, which is your limbic system in your brain? Or are you overriding in shooting your central nervous system, right? So you're in bed, it's warm, the alarm goes off. You look to your phone. It's got a big orange snooze button and a little <laughs> black off button, right? So because your determination is not that high, the first ring of the bell, you hit the snooze button. And you got, okay, I got nine more minutes. Determination is not very high, right? And then it goes off in nine minutes. And you're thinking, man, I think you're looking. I think I can squeeze another nine minutes out of it. So you hit the snooze button again, right? And then once that nine minutes goes, you got 18 minutes have just gone by. And now you're like, it goes off again. You're like, oh my gosh, I have to get up, right? So same task, but now your determination is higher. So you hit the off button. Because what you do when you hit the off button is you automatically increase your determination because you know that now if you fall back asleep, you're going to oversleep and you're going to be late for whatever appointment it is for that particular day. So if people don't have appointments that day, they have no deadlines. Therefore, their dedicate or their determination is not high and they'll just keep hitting the snooze button. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's creating these deadlines for yourself, whether it is you have to get up and work out or get up and, you know, go shoot your bow or get up and go to school or whatever it is. Right. It's that hitting the off button instead of the snooze button. Right. Knowing when, where and how to put your conscious mind into a specific task at a specific moment. So that's your moment of truth. Every time you reach for one of those buttons, that's your moment of truth. And when you go to the off button, right, then you're playing the mental game of even getting your butt out of bed in the morning. Everything we do has this moment of truth. So in training, you identify the task. And then you identify the moment within that task. And the how of concentration is always through speech. So you're talking yourself through these things. So now, once we understand what this mental game is, now we can truly practice it for whatever our task is. Right? Like think about a, an anxiety attack. There's a moment at which this person has to gain conscious control of their mind or they're going to spin out. Right. So this is this moment of truth. And once they go through that one time, they go, OK, this is what was happening now. This is my moment. This is I need to put my conscious mind here. Right. Maybe in a different whatever, wherever they need to go to gain control. And the how is through speech. So it's very interesting that we can now take this model that we've used in shooting for a long time now and apply it to just about everything in life. So it's pretty cool.
No, yeah, I I would agree with that a hundred percent. When I when I talk to people about health coaching them uh, mm-hmm. through just nutritional changes, there is that moment of truth when you're like reaching for the chips exactly. or whatever junk food, and you're like, exactly. and then you think of the picture that you took, and you're like, man, I'm fat. I need to change that. And that's yeah. that moment of truth. Is like that determination switch, yeah. you know, and you back off. Um, you know, that's, that's a great, that's awesome. I love that definition. That's, that's really yep. good. Are you going to get like an honorary degree of, uh, psychiatry or, so I, <laughs> or psychology? I, here's what's going on. I mean, I have these psychiatrists calling me now, mm-hmm. right. And Hey, how do you think this would work with ADHD? I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, <laughs> am I getting paid? Like you're getting paid, you know? So, I mean, I had, uh, I had the psychologist that is attached to first group special forces come and watch me do a clinic because what happens with doctors, and this is no dig on doctors. They're obviously very smart people, but they don't seem to know the depth of the solution. Hmm. Meaning they go so deep, like to the synaptic level of the sciences that we're working with in shooting that it becomes intangible. And what I'm talking about is tangible concentration. I need to concentrate right now on this thing, maybe this movement that causes an explosion, maybe myself if I'm having an anxiety attack or something like that, anger management, whatever. You need to gain conscious control, and the solution to that is a specific depth Hmm. of explanation. And most doctors seem to go too deep. And that's just, there's no dig on them. It's just what I've found. So when I bring it to this other depth for them, they can, oh, oh, now they can apply it. (laughs) And it's very interesting because a lot of doctors, especially when we're talking about shooting, you know, there's sports psychologists all over the place, but they've never played the sport that they're teaching people. (laughs) Right? Yep. So... I mean, this... or the entrepreneur teacher that has never started a business or, you know, things like that. That's, that's, it's a sad, it's a sad thing, but it, it would almost be like you teaching archery, like sh- the shooting process that you teach and, or them coming to you and you going way down the rabbit hole of, well, knock tuning and paper tuning and like going way that way mm-hmm. into the, the nitty gritty of it, which in all reality, you're just needing to fix the way that you, you know, execute your release. So, right. That's awesome. Once you fix that, once you gain control of your release movement, then you can do all those other things and get the potential out of them. Because I don't care if you've got phenomenal form, if you punch the trigger, (laughs) your form is then blown apart by a pre-ignition movement. So let's gain some some mental control of our shot first, and then you can actually get the potential of all these corrections and all the advice that's out there. There's tons of it, right? But uh, yeah, so we have our solution is now at a very specific level. It's tangible. We're doing this, then this, then this, then this. It's very, it's simple. It's not easy, right? It's the conscious override of your central nervous system. So it's not easy, but now we can at least map how we do it. It's very powerful when you, I mean, as you well know, cause you have control of your shot, you mm-hmm. know how you're going to shoot your shot on your bull elk next year. That is very powerful to know. Now I just need to find a bull elk to shoot. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Too easy. Oh man. Um, no, that that's amazing. Well, you know, I, I've obviously, I'm obviously a success from, you know, at least the shooting aspect of it. I still have yet to put down an elk, by the way. Um, so if you've seen the extra send them my way, uh, okay. but I'm, I'm working on that aspect my shot's great. So when there's an elk there, I'm going to be good. But, uh, you know, other than my success and the things that I've told people, and obviously there's other people out there as well. Um, your son's done pretty decent <laughs> in the archery community. Uh, right. for those people that don't know of, of Brody or Bodie, Bodie. sorry, Bodie Turner, uh, sorry, I've got a son named Brody, so I always get those two mixed up. But um, if you haven't heard of him, tell him a little. He's accomplished a couple of things. He's won a couple of, you know, national titles. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Bodie started shooting a bow when he was 10 and a half months old. And he, he couldn't even stand up. And he would 
lean against the couch. He draws bow back and he would fall over and then he'd let the string go. <laughs> and at two and a half, he's shooting balloons out of the air with his little suction cup arrows. But at three years old, I bought him his first compound and I saw the same things in him that I see in most people in my clinic. I, I bought him a little tiny wrist strap release and he shot it good one time, <laughs> right? As we all do, we get one chance to shoot our bow perfectly. And then your mind understands the explosion that's going to happen. And then, you know, we just start down the road of target panic. So I watched him punch a trigger for the first time. And I'm like, I know too much about this. I'm not going to let my young son go through the same thing that I went through my entire life. So I bought him a tension activated release. And that is a huge key for parents that are trying to get their kids to shoot with control. A tension activated release is a mechanical fix to a mental problem. So because their kids don't have enough determination to override their own central nervous system in shooting. They just usually do not have enough determination to do that. So can I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but let me just kind of highlight that there for parents okay. out there. Stop getting frustrated with your kids because there's right. just some things that you're not going to be able to fix because they are children. They're not adults. I'm not perfect. I still have that times where I'm like, I just wish you would just do this. Right. But mm -hmm. That's that's a huge golden nugget right there that I, I love that you noticed that you didn't get frustrated by it and try and out coach that you're like, OK, well, how can I help as much as possible without just doing it for him? So I love that. Right. Anyway, sorry. So tension active release works like it has a safety on it, right? So you push the safety in, you hook it on your little D loop, push the safety in, draw back and aim. And they'll instantly be able to aim with no anxiety because the safety is on. That is a key point. So then once they're on, they let their thumb off the safety and then they just pull. Right. And if they don't pull, their bow's not going off. So it forces their mind into making the decision to pull. And the it's beautiful because you can set it. However you want, don't set it to where they just pull a little bit. Make them actually pull and move so they can feel what's happening. And you don't need to say anything about it. Just set their release different. You don't even need to tell them, right? So simple. Push safety in, draw back and aim, safety off, and then pull. And you don't even need to do this with a sight. Like let them shoot bare bow. Let them see the flight of the arrow. Let them shoot balloons all these things. And when you think they're ready, you can certainly put a sight on their bow. That's cool. When you get them, you know, when they're mature enough to have an actual anchor point and all that stuff. But for the time being, it, now here's a key point. And oh my gosh, I hope people don't get pissed off at me for this. <laughs> this is just the reality of it. Males and females see trajectory paths completely differently. So if you have a daughter a young daughter, when she draws back her bow, she's going to have way better form than your son does, right? She's going to draw back her bow and she's instantly going to put the point of the arrow on the target and she's going to shoot feet over the target. <laughs> Whereas a young boy can draw back and get all stupid with anchor point, no anchor point whatsoever, and still hit things because their mind sees where the arrow is going. The female mind sees what the arrow is touching. It's two completely different things, right? And it only happens in firearms and in archery with no sights. So if you have a young female, just make sure that you like hang a tennis ball or something off of the target so that she has something to put the arrow point on mm. every single time. For males, you can do that as well, but you'll be able to take the take the ball away much easier for males. So females are usually better shooters than males because they seem to be more process-based thinkers. But that one little thing makes for massively frustrated females, especially in the adult world, when let's say that their their husband or significant other or whatever shoots bare bow and mm -hmm. just wants them to shoot bare bow the same way they do not see trajectory paths the same way. Like think about if you have a newer vehicle and you hit the backup camera, right? 
now it shows the trajectory path of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. That's for the female mind. That's not for the male mind. Hmm. Females see what the trailer is touching. Males see where the trailer is going. It's hmm. two different things. That's why there's so few female truck drivers. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. Right. So that's... they just see it differently. Not that it can't be trained any out or anything right. different, but just from the initial get go, they'll, they're going to see trajectory paths completely differently. So tension activated release. Bodie was shooting a tension activated release at three years old. By the time he was about mm, seven, seven or eight, I was able to give him a different release. And I always had him shooting a pinky trigger, right? Hmm. So he'd have his little hand on there, and it was a it was a pinky trigger called a uh, a ringer, right? They don't even make him hmm. anymore, but that's what he shot, and he shot at Barbo. So he'd draw back, and the release would be way up here by his eyeball, <laughs> and but he's left eye dominant, so he's seeing the hmm. arrow come in from way at an angle. But it didn't matter. I mean, shooting gophers in Montana and all that stuff. Your eye can aim so amazingly that we just have to give it a chance. And so then things progressed. Then he wanted to, I asked him a long time ago, I go, what do you want to do with archery? He goes, I want to make money. I'm like, okay, well, if you want to make money, then you have to shoot a compound movable site. And that's what we'll do. So he uh, started winning in these tournaments simply because he had control. Whereas I mean, he's shooting against adults at nine, 10 years old. The adult doesn't want to lose to a 10 year old, right? <laughs> so they start thinking about losing to a 10 year old. Therefore they punch the trigger where all Bodie knows is shot control. So he just, you know, he'd draw back that hinge, then he'd roll it to a click. Then here I go making that decision. And then he would just increase the roll and he'd shoot him in the X. So then he won at, um, let me think. I think he was 13 when he won Vegas in the young adult category. And then he turned 15 one day before he won Vegas in the adult pro category in 2022. So uh, just phenomenal work. And he had won the Rushmore Rumble just a little bit before that or the year before that mm -hmm. when all the COVID craziness was going on. So he won Vegas. Uh, he shot the first six or the third 660 ever qualification round at Lancaster. That's 60 X's in a row. So he hit a dime 60 times in a row. It only wow. been done three times in history in the 19 year history of that tournament. And uh, then fast forward to 2023, he shoots another 660. So now he's the first person ever in history to shoot two 660s, especially back to back at Lancaster. And wow. then he wins Lancaster this year. And then he won the Indoor World Series at Vegas, which is a separate tournament that's that's held at mm -hmm. Vegas as well. So he won that. And then he took fifth in Vegas. He did a side adjustment that cost him this year. Oh. So we, uh, you know, we do not fight science in our shot in mm -hmm. any way, shape, or form. Like, we know that we're going to talk ourselves through the shot. We know that we're we're not worried about our aim, but that's where most archers get hung up is they're so worried about the aim that they weight their bow up through stabilization and weights on their stabilizer <laughs> so fast or so slowly that their pin moves slowly on the target. Well, you try to couple that with a surprise break and it just doesn't work out because why would you want your pin to move slowly? Like if you're, if it's on the, on the 10 ring, why would you want it to move slowly and not know when it's going to go off. Right. And so if you don't let it get back to center fast enough, when it breaks in the nine ring and it hits a nine ring, that shows you that you slowed down the rate of return too much. So mm. we keep our pin moving very fast. So we keep our bow pretty light, keep our, our holding weight up slightly and our draw length just a hair shorter than what would be normal. And that keeps that pin speed very fast. So Bodie's, pin can break the shot can break and his pin can be anywhere in the gold and it will hit an x that's wow. how fast the rate of return is so and you awesome. usually usually won't see that unless you're shooting through a magnified lens and, you know Bodhi shoots a four power mm. and but a lot of people shoot six eight power whatever it may be but yeah those people that are 
super weighting their bow, those are also people that are usually punching the trigger because they're trying to keep, they're trying to get the pin. Okay. It's almost in the middle. Okay. It's in the middle. Mm, and then break. that has to be in the middle long enough for their brain to send the signal for them to punch the trigger. The problem is when they punch the trigger is that there will always be some pre-ignition movement linked to that trigger motor program. And yes, it can get you to a very high level of shooting, but when the stress gets worse, like if you punch the trigger from like, if this was the trigger, if you punch it from right there, that's going to be a different impact point than if you punch it from there. Mm. So depending on the distance that you create from the trigger, when you snatch that thing, depends on how much range of motion you've put or you've left to the pre-ignition movement. So that's Jeez. what will miss the dime. And if you don't hit the dime, then you're not going to be in the, <laughs> you're not going to win. Yeah. So. Huh. That is, yeah. that's intense. Yeah. Cause I, so I, I see that a lot where I'm like, how do you even hold that bow up? Like, it's just so heavy. And, um, something else that, you know, you, you've asked us and I started looking at it now, um, at, at other, and I obviously don't say anything. Don't be that guy on the range guys. Like yeah, right. <laughs> if you see other people mess with, like, don't be that guy, just let them, you know, until they ask a question, don't, don't offer that unsolicited advice. Um, just hand them Joel's Joel Turner's card and walk away. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> uh, no, but, but I, I watch them as they, they, they don't sky draw, but like they'll draw, you know, up here, they'll draw and then they come and I watch them slowly go down and boom. And I'm like, Oh man, like, <laughs> yeah. like I see it now, yeah. you know, <laughs> and you it just, it blows there, me away. There's a few archers out there that are very good at that. Right. And, but do they want to teach that shot to somebody else? And you ask them like, absolutely not. I wouldn't want anybody else to do this. Right. <laughs> We're all trying to get this surprise break. There are some people and they're usually of a very specific, very calm personality that if they want to mm. punch a trigger, they can still be successful with that. But a lot of times it bites them in the butt. And I'm just saying there's a different way of doing it. That's where you're not fighting science. Because those people are on the road to disaster, whether they know it or not. Just how long can you stay on that road when you're get right? When you're getting a little get right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't go, oh, gosh, right? I mean, that's, I don't know. I, I just, it, I cringe every time I see it. But those people uh, usually end up shooting against Bodie in the, in the final. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's you're like, there's okay. Only one or two, there's only one or two of them out there. So it's, it's pretty yeah. interesting. No, that's awesome. Yeah. And that's, and I think you mentioned it in another podcast that you're like, there's another, and that's the way you were just talking about. There's, there's another way that works, but it's not as repeatable. Like it's almost as good, but it's not. A, and that's the thing. The key is being repeatable. Like, how do you, yeah. how can you train yourself to, you know, I guess ex execute under stress, like take that stress and turn it into almost a superpower. You're, you're taking and, the mystery, you're taking the mystery out of it. Like hmm. those people that are punching the trigger, it's a mystery on what they're going to do that particular shot. Are they going to have two gitchy goos or just one, right? Or none. Mm -hmm. They don't know. Whereas we know that we're going to, there's four things in your shot. You're going to draw back and aim. Then you're going to address the trigger. Then you're going to say, here I go. Then you're going to talk yourself through the movement. And when you do that over and over and over again, it doesn't become, you don't allow it to become automatic, but you blueprint it. And you mm -hmm. know how it's going to go before you ever draw your bow back. And that's where the power comes from. Exactly. Yep. Just being in that, being, being able to focus on that, that moment, mm -hmm. you know, and, and have your, like you continue saying that blueprint, mm -hmm. making sure it happens no matter what, no matter what's around you, whether Joel Turner's being a, a butthead in your ear, or, <laughs> you know, you're out there in the quiet of the woods and there's right. nothing around you except for you and that deer or you and that elk. Um, you know, that, that's something that that's super important or even just in the home, you know, you're, you're, you're button heads with your son, you know, or your daughter comes home late or, you know, things like that, that, that are super important. You know, you can make or break relationships, um, mm -hmm. you know, again, having that moment of truth and being yeah. able to, to understand like when that moment of truth happens, no matter what the situation is, this is how I'm going to react. And, right. and so, yeah, that's, I love it. I love so it. when you. When you blueprint a shot, now take these four questions and change the questions slightly for your particular task. But in shooting, 
Question number one of the blueprint, what were you thinking about after here I go? Hmm. And in shooting, you should be thinking about your shot activation movement. Whatever movement it is that makes your release go off. I don't care what it is as long as it's closed loop, meaning slow enough you could stop it. So what am I thinking after here I go? Question number two, what am I saying after here I go? That could also be said as how am I thinking? Because how you're thinking is through speech. That's how you're mm -hmm. directing your conscious mind is through speech. So number one, what am I thinking about after here I go? Number two, what am I saying after here I go? Number three, could I have stopped it? Meaning was I so keenly concentrated on that shot activation movement that I could have stopped it anywhere within it? Not that you should have stopped it, mm -hmm. but I'm moving so slow and I'm so concentrated on it that I could stop it anywhere. It's more of a rate of rate of movement question. And then what decisions did I make to get myself in the process for this one shot? So those are the four questions of the blueprint that you ask yourself. And when you can answer those, you know exactly how you did it. So change the question slightly for your task, be it, you know, fatherhood or anxiety or golf or basketball or whatever you're doing. What is the blueprint? because you will find success with this conscious control of your mind. But if you don't blueprint it, it's just a fleeting moment in time, right? That you won't be able to repeat. Exactly. Yeah. Cause time keeps moving forward no matter what. Oh, yeah. I and mean, that's one thing you can't get back. You can get back a bunch of stuff. You can't get back any time. So no, I, I definitely agree with you there. That's, that's awesome. So yeah, guys, um, you definitely don't want to go shoot Vegas now because then you'll be competing against a, you know, a, a teenager, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's been awesome watching him, to be honest with you. Like, it, it's really cool yeah. to see that. And I love when, you know, the naysayers uh, of your program, whatever it may be, um, you know, you're like, you can't really debate the fact that this is his dad. He's taught him since he was 10 months old. <laughs> and it works that a 15 year old, basically 14 year old plus a day, yeah. you yeah. know, is out there crushing it. And, and, that's just, and it's repeatable again, it's something that has been repeated over and over and over again. So that's just, that, that's amazing. And, and again, congratulations to, to Bodie that's and your family. Yeah, that's it's, amazing. He, it's so cool to, to be his dad and just watch this because like I said, archery is my life. It's been my life since I was seven years old and to see his success and not have to go through the things that I went through in target panic and all that craziness, just to watch him you know, hit his potential and just keep going. It's just going to get nothing but better. Why wouldn't it? You know, mm -hmm. why wouldn't he get better? He's not going to fall into target panic. I don't have to worry about Bodie Turner punching a trigger. That just isn't going to happen. He knows too much. He's been in too many. He's won just about every indoor archery tournament. He's won the biggest ones in the world. So by the time he's 16, so now it's just now he's seeing how many times he can win it because he's going to be <laughs> he's going to be in the adult class for the next 34 years. You don't get in the senior class till you're 50. He's got mm -hmm. 34 years of the adult class. He wants to win Vegas more than any human being. He wants to shoot a 990 X at Vegas, which is totally doable for him. And, uh, so he's got some, he's got lofty goals, but they are, they will be attained. Uh, just raising the bar. I, I yeah. have no question about that. Yeah. The you bar know, has that, been raised because people are getting, I mean, shot IQ has been a revolution. I know that's kind of an arrogant statement because it's my thing, but the bar has been raised. We're, we're no longer so, so consumed by the aim and punching triggers and doing all, waiting for it to go off. It's all just been debunked. Now the mm -hmm. code has been cracked on how to gain control of yourself. So the level of shooting, like this year, there was 27 shooters in, in the Vegas shoot off that wow. shot nine hundreds, right? So the, the bar is being raised for sure. And that's crazy. And, and I mean, isn't that just the story of fatherhood though? At least, you know, and I always try and distinguish this good dads, good, good fathers want their children to supersede them. You want to take your 
wisdom that you've learned through experience, many, many years of, of failure, uh, and, and teach them so they don't have to go through that and learn necessarily that way they can learn from your experience and your, your wisdom. And that's amazing. And I, I, I love seeing that, um, yeah. You know, it literally changes generations being able to do that. Um, You know, people always want to talk about wealth change in generations. Well, what about just the simple mundane day to day task or the mental game change, Mm -hmm. you know, that you've you've put for him Mm -hmm. and then in turn your grandchildren and great grandchildren. And and that's just changed generations. So that's it's amazing. It's awesome to see. Um, So other than a 990 X at Vegas. <laughs> what are some, what are some goals that you guys have, uh, you know, moving forward, uh, whether it be with shot IQ hunting. I mean, you just mentioned you're going to New Zealand, right? So, yeah, next, you know, next week going to New Zealand. So Bodie's done very well in the hunting world. And, uh, I mean, he's, he's killed more critters than I ever thought about killing when I was, when I was younger, but, uh, so yeah, we're going to New Zealand. A red, a red stag has been my mm. bucket list critter. I don't even know if Bodie has bucket list critters because he's gotten to shoot so much stuff. I mean, he's very spoiled in the hunting world to the point that it's very difficult to hunt with Bodie Turner now <laughs> because he gives me advice or, you know, shushes me or whatever. I'm like, yeah, kid, I taught you that a long time ago. <laughs> Maybe you've forgotten the old man does know a thing or two about it. That's so, awesome. Uh, but he likes to hunt by himself, which is cool. I like to hunt by myself. You know, we hunt together as much as we can. I got to call him in a bull this year, which was really cool. And, uh, he smoked that, but a red stag for me to call in a red stag and kill it with a longbow. And I'm going even one step further this year. I'm going to probably be killing it with a wood arrow and a D shaped longbow with a wood arrow. I'm going to call it in. I'm not doing spot and stock. I want to call one of these things in. And that's why we're going during the roar. And uh, it's going to be, it's going to be amazing. Even if I don't get one, it's going to be an amazing experience. And I'm going to basically get two elk ruts per year now, New Zealand, and then in the West. So it's going to be. That's amazing. No, that's really awesome. And that's definitely a bucket list. I've actually got it here on my, my vision board that I look at every single day is elk and red stag. They're right there. And, uh, and, and there's just something about that interaction. Like what you're saying, you don't just want to walk in on one. You want to have that interaction with them for, and I've mentioned this a couple of times. I had, um, uh, do you know, uh, uh, Pedro Ampuero? Oh, yeah. He's a, uh, yeah. Okay. So I had him on the podcast and we talked about it. He loves, he's obviously stag culture, sure. loves red stags. Um, and so we talked about that interaction. It's just a whole different ball game. There's the, there's the elk bugle and then uh-huh. there's the roar of red stags that are just, I mean, it's just, it's something out of this world. It's, it's different. It's like when you hear an elk for the first time, you're like, wait, yeah. that thing makes that sound you know yeah. uh it's the but same with red stacks i mean they're almost the same species so when you listen to mm. them their sounds are are vastly different yet similar because you'll mm. notice that when a stag is with hinds he doesn't chuckle just mm. like when a bull is talking to cows he doesn't chuckle right so if you want to piss a bull elk off You get in close to his cows and you do the bull calling cows bugle, which is short, raspy, no chuckles. If you get in on the hunt on a, on a stag with hinds, it's the same sound. It's just, it sounds Hmm. different. It's much deeper, obviously. Mm -hmm. And the sounds that the hinds make when you, when you equate that to the sound of a cow elk or a calf, it's similar. It's just deeper. And it actually, Mm -hmm. I don't know of any call system that you could do a red stag hind with hmm. it's a very strange sound but it's it's like a it's like an uh, a cow mew that's slowed down digitally it's crazy hmm. they sound. i haven't i haven't heard the hind so i'm gonna have to go look that yeah. one up now it's somewhat uh, of a i mean there's not a lot of footage of that sound but there is some out there on instagram i have some saved so it's pretty interesting hmm. so i've been yeah i've been practicing doing some voice calling <laughs> no, that's awesome. And I know you mentioned it at the beginning of the podcast, but you know, Joel, Joel's got his own, uh, 
everyone's got their own sequences of calls. You know, it seems mm. like you can go online and look them up. There's a whole bunch of different sure. uh, schooling and, and, and thought process behind it. Um, I found yours really interesting uh, hearing it at Elk Shape because <laughs> there's a lot of them that are pretty similar. Um, but you kind of go at, go at it in, in a different way. Right. Um, why, like, how have you, well, first off, you don't kill that many elk in a year, right? I mean, you, you've only gone through process, probably a thousand plus elk <laughs> in your <laughs> lifetime. Right. So yeah, you don't know I've much done, about elk. I've done a lot. So I, <laughs> I get to do some culling for the state and then also for some open air zoos, I do some culling. So I, yeah, I, I get to work on a lot of elk every year. <laughs> yeah. So you don't, you don't ever know anything about their sounds or, you know, why yeah. they do what, you know, <laughs> and, and people don't realize that, you know, they, they see you, they're like, Oh, he's the shot guy. And then you come at us with this, this strange, different <laughs> way of calling. And we're like, yeah. wait a second, like, what, where's this coming from? And, uh, but you know, kind of talk, I guess just briefly, on why you why you teach the way that you teach your your elk calling. I didn't learn how to call elk from elk. I learned how to call elk from watching drunk human beings in bar <laughs> fights. As a cop, I was a cop for almost 21 years and I went to a lot of bar fights and they're almost always over a female. However, most people will approach elk calling a completely different way. So like if, if I said, okay, we're, we're standing at the doorway of the bar and I'm giving you 30 seconds to go in and get punched by another male. <laughs> you can't use your hands. You can only use your words. What's your strategy? And most people will say, I'm going to go and I'm going to find a dude. I'm going to, you know, spit in his face or I'm going to yell at him or whatever. And if you do that, it's completely reliant on that male's attitude at that moment. Right. You haven't done anything instinctual or instinctive mm -hmm. to him to make him fight you. But if he has a female there that he's <laughs> trying to protect and you go and you speak directly to her inappropriately and you don't talk to him. It's a whole new level of rage. Right. That's how you get punched in the face in a bar. No matter what country you're in or what language you speak, <laughs> it's about the structure of your speech, not the quality of your speech. So people are like, oh, well, you know, I don't I don't compete in elk calling competitions. I don't sound that good. You don't have to sound that good. You just have to not chuckle. Right. <laughs> if you chuckle, that is a bull talking to another bull. So therefore, it depends on that bull's attitude, whether he comes to fight you or not. But if you go in and you talk only to his females, then he has no option but to remove you from the bar. So that's how you get these bulls to come to you to remove you from the bar. So you just get in tight on the cows, try to get within 60, 70 yards of the cows, get ready, and then do a short raspy bugle with no chuckles. You just spoke to his cows. He's now going to come try to kill you. Cause that's how mammal biology works. Right. So I've called in, well, it's now it's 50. I've called in 50. I know it sounds like a random number, but it's 50 now in the last eight years. Hmm. So I've called in 50 herd bulls to this one sound hmm. in the last eight seasons. So yeah. and I've called in hundreds of satellite bulls, but the way that I call in satellite bulls is I don't ever, I never, I have not in the last six years made a mature cow sound because cows hate other cows. Like when is the last time a human female got together with all their girlfriends and talked nicely about another female that wants to procreate with her man? <laughs> it doesn't happen, right? So you can't expect mammals to do that. Females protect their male, right? Cows choose the bull. Bulls don't choose cows. Cows choose their bull. So they become very protective of him. So then you come in and you give your little hoochie mama in the in the bushes, right? They're not going to allow their bull to go over there. So therefore, the cows will lead the bull away. Hmm. So yep. just keep all of your, if you're going to do female elk sounds, keep them on the calf spectrum. Very high. Right? So don't ever, as soon as you get into the cow spectrum, those cows' ears will come forward. They'll be on radar mode, and they'll just, oh, they get all nervous. 
and they start moving those cows away or move the whole herd away. So calf sounds and a bull calling cow's bugle are two very key sounds for you that make elk come to you instead of driving elk from you. And that's all from bar fights, right? <laughs> it's, it's a different perspective, but it is the perspective of mammals with no inhibitions, mm -hmm. right? Cause as soon as human beings get drunk, they just, they lose all sense and off they go. They turn into bull elk and that's how they <laughs> get in bar fights. Well, that's awesome. Well, just, uh, just kind of wrapping up here, I, I want to ask you, so you, you mentioned, a, a you know, New Zealand red stag is a bucket list. If you had, now that you are going on that hunt, mm -hmm. um, one other hunt that you have in mind, that would be a dream hunt. Is that the one, or is there another one that you've got on your list that you would there's, absolutely there's love? One, there's one other one and it's on an Island near Kodiak and it'd be for Sitka blacktails. And my dad was stationed there in 1965 in the Coast Guard. Hmm. He spent a year on this island and never saw a deer. And then it became a destination place for Sitka blacktails. Hmm. And, but my dad doesn't see deer anywhere he goes. <laughs> so it's, doesn't surprise me that the old man never saw any deer there, but I want to go to this Island. It's a logistical nightmare to get there. There's no bears on it. Uh, supposedly it's still pretty decent for black. It's not like Kodiak or something like that, but I want to go there. The buildings that my dad stayed in are still there. The old air force base is still there. The Loran stations are still there. There's obviously nobody in them it's all abandoned buildings on this island and i just want to go there and just because i have all the pictures of my old man on this place and i just want to go there and experience that if whether i kill a deer or not so be it but <laughs> that's the uh, that's the only other bucket list thing that i have hmm. you know people are like what about sheep and goats and bears and i'm like i've never seen a six by six doll sheep and i've never heard a bear bugle so I really don't, I don't, whatever. Right. Yeah. So you like the interaction piece. You, I do. You, I love yeah. calling things and figuring out the sounds, figuring out the science of the sounds and then applying that. And just, I mean, that's kind of how we, I approach most things. It seems like, and, uh, I love it. I love calling things to me. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, absolutely. That you've you've dropped a lot of knowledge bombs here for us, and I I appreciate your time. I know you've got uh, burgers waiting for you, oh. um, but <laughs> we joked about that before the podcast. His yeah. his uh, wife was pulling burgers off the grill before I yeah. pulled him away. So uh, obviously, you know, I I'm I'm I feel um, I'm really grateful for your time. Really appreciate that. If there's one thing, one other thing that maybe we didn't bring up that you'd love to leave with the people listening. Um, and then after that, where can they find you? So <clears throat> what I will say to folks is stop practicing your own failure. If you're going to the range and you are shooting and you're punching the trigger the slightest bit and you know that you're doing that, every time you shoot, you're practicing your own failure for high stress events. So fix it. You first have to have enough determination. And where you find that, I can't help you find. I mean, I can help you find it, but I can't teach it to you, right? Nobody can teach somebody else determination. There's got to be some frustration level where you get to. You're like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to do it this way no matter what. And that's the decision that you have to make. So you first got to be determined enough. So that you make a decision, the decision will increase your presence. And once you're present enough, then you can concentrate. And so, but if you keep practicing your own failure, you're as good as you're going to get. And you may be six months into your archery career. It's as good as you're going to get just because there will be pre-ignition movements linked to your trigger motor program. If you're going, if you're punching on a trigger, you're literally the victim of your own mind. So stop practicing your own failure. There is a whole other way of doing business that relieves all the frustration 
and all the stuff. So Shot IQ is shotiq.com. That's where all my online courses are. And Joel Turner underscore Shot IQ on Instagram. And just check it out. It's really cool stuff. It's very powerful. And, and now we're starting to figure out how you can use it in other forms in your life. Yep. And then you're going to get your honorary psychology degree. Right. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. That's awesome. Well, again, I appreciate your time, guys. I'm going to leave the links down below where you can find Joel. Uh, he really did. I was lucky to come across you before I caused any bad habits. Um, okay. And I was also open minded enough that any bad habits I had formed at that point, I was willing to let him go and, and learn the right way. And I'll say it, you know, and, and I know you say it, but I'll, I'll drill that in. There is a right way uh, where you can enjoy shooting archery. Now, I'm not a target archer. Uh, but I hear so many people say, if you love archery, don't get into target shooting. Oh, I bet. No. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I bet if you talk to Bodie, he would not say that. Yeah. Uh, he probably absolutely loves it. So you have to um, use it, right. You got to use target archery for, mm -hmm. cause it's the only place that you're going to find high stress in your shooting. So get out there and compete and just learn from it. Right. It teaches you so much about your shot. Exactly. Exactly. So I'll leave those links down below guys. Check out Joel, his information, uh, go watch some videos of Bodie crushing it over in Vegas. And, uh, as I always say, guys, get out live your life and love it.